It's, it's time to start the second panel of this afternoon. Uh, the title of the panel, uh, could we leave the lights on in the, in the, uh, thank you. Uh, Don't want you falling asleep. You know, it's, uh, uh, our, our singing is not what it used to be. Um, our, the title of the panel is Our Automation and the Coming Post-Scarcity Economy Making Humans Superfluous. Uh, before starting a couple of, of remarks, first I'd like to express my appreciation uh, to uh, Roger Berkowitz for having organized this panel, to the Hannah Arendt Center uh, for bringing it into existence, essentially it means for Roger and people helping him bringing it into existence. Uh, also to, to Bard College uh, and its president, Leon Botstein, uh, Bard being one of the most innovative and interesting colleges uh, in the country at this point, uh, producing, I think, more serious education uh, than many places. Uh, secondly, uh, unfortunately, Drusilla Cornell is ill and is not going to be uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, Drusilla, uh, it's especially unfortunate because aside from being a lawyer, a professor of political theory, an organizer of uh, a, a very important movement uh, uh, in South Africa. Um, she was also a labor organizer, and she knows of what she speaks. Uh, in exchange, you get, or not really in exchange, you're going to get, I will make some preliminary remarks, and they're really remarks or they're illustrations of a couple of points. Uh, we will then follow with uh, Jerome Cohen to my immediate left and David S. Rose, whom I will introduce at, at that particular, particular time. Uh, a couple of, and these are really vignettes that I'm offering here because they relate to the things that we've been talking about. Uh, the notion of post-scarcity, which is in the title of this panel, uh, implies that there, it's coming, that there could be a time when, in fact, one might say economic issues as we understand them, that is, economic issues deriving from the experience of scarcity, uh, will no longer be a, uh, a question, will no longer be a matter. Uh, we will have ample access to that which we need. Uh, of course, the replicator on Star Trek uh, gives you some sense of what that kind of thing perhaps might be. But the, uh, but the more basic point is one could get beyond a point where people were in conflict with each other over scarce resources. And the question which is raised out of that is obviously the question of perhaps we can arrive at such a situation. Certainly uh, there would be great things achieved if we did. Does it follow from that that there would be no other reasons for conflict? And uh, if you are a old-fashioned or simple, not to say simplistic Marxist, you might say if there are no economic conflicts, then there are no reasons for political conflicts. But it's not completely clear to me that that's the case. So one question is going to be in this is, to what degree are there other sources of conflict than those deriving from, from scarcity? This is a panel, this is a conference in which questions of new technology play an enormously important role. Uh, we heard this morning from Ray Kurzweil, uh, we heard him say that decentralization, which he associates with the new technology, produces social networks, and this in turn produces change. And the vision here is in some sense of uh, in networks, be it the sort of Facebook or cell phones or so forth, of people organizing, shall we say, on a horizontal level rather than on a vertical level. And I want to give two, raise two particular questions and cases uh, which I think need, are relevant to that particular kind of claim. Uh, the first has to do uh, is from, from experiences in 1964. 1964, before the Civil Rights Act, uh, as you know, the South was, uh, was still a very segregated region of the country. Uh, in uh, the early, late spring, early summer of that year, uh, a large number of northern, mainly white students assembled in southern Ohio uh, to plan what became called the Freedom Summer. Uh, during the course of the two weeks they spent in Ohio, 
They were drilled, they were taught, they were instructed as precisely how to behave, what to do, where to go, when. This was a democratic movement, but it was organized face down, top down, sorry. It was organized, it was face down too at a certain point if you ever got hit over the head. Uh, it was organized top down, and it was organized uh, not on, one might say, a democratic basis. It was organized, one might almost say, on a Leninist basis. Yet it was for a particular purpose, which many of us recognize as valid. It is not clear to me it could have been done with cell phones. Second particular, second illustration comes from uh, events of a couple, about two years ago in China. In a western province of China, Xinjiang, there is a large number of people of originally Turkic and Muslim uh, extraction. There is a movement which th dreams of, shall we say, a larger Turkmenistan, which would go sort of from Turkey to these western regions of China. It is said, the evidence, let's, let's assume that what is said is the case here, that people involved in that movement conducted, began to conduct in Xinjiang and its capital city a certain amount of almost, one might say, terrorist activities, which consisted in, believe it or not, of going about in public places with syringes, not filled with poison or anything, and pricking people, you know, jabbing them, hurting them. And authorities report several hundred people winding up in the hospital as a consequence to this. This produced a great amount of distress among the Han, native Chinese, of whom there were a great many there. And they all had, as Ray Kurzweil said this morning, cell phones. And they began to communicate with each other to do something about this, because this was just going on and on. And they, were, they came together in this kind of cell phone network, and they eventually appealed to Beijing to get something done about it, because nothing was happening on the local level. And lo and behold, intervention from Beijing produced the situation in which uh, the mayor of the capital city was fired, the party secretary of Xinjiang was fired, as were a number of other officials, for having been inadequately attentive to the needs of the people. Looks like a democratic movement, and indeed in many ways it was. It also served to reinforce the legitimacy of Beijing. And so you have one, two sides to this, and one wants to think about uh, that in relation to this, uh, these, these questions of decentralization producing social networks, which it did, and producing change, which it did, but also producing other consequences. My third example is something quite different, and it comes out of uh, some reflections on uh, a short story by Heinrich von Kleist, The Marionette Theater, which I won't go into at this particular point, though those of you who know it may recognize a derivation from it. It also comes from uh, my reading of so somebody that uh, Tom Dumb mentioned this afternoon, Stanley Cavell, uh, who picks up some of these, uh, an example not dissimilar to this uh, in the latter part of one of, his, one of his books. Let us imagine that I have a, I know a craftsman, as there is in the Kleist story. And I go and visit the craftsman, and the craftsman says to me one day, look at this, is it not fantastic? Almost looks lifelike. And he points to this figure sitting there with his legs crossed, smoking a cigarette, and says, the motions are a little jerky, but isn't it extraordinary, he says. And I look at it, and the head is a little awkward, seems obviously fake. And I roll up the, take off the gloves, and the glove, the hands are clearly mechanical. And uh, the knees don't quite cross right, and so forth. But I go away, and I come back some time later, a month, a year, years, doesn't matter. And the craftsman says, we're making fantastic progress. Look at this figure. And the figure now, the hands look almost natural. The movements of the head are almost perfect. The smoke goes in and it goes out. And the knees cross and uncross, terrific. 
And the craftsman says, isn't it extraordinary what progress you're making? And he takes out a knife, and he goes over, excuse me, Jerry, and he pries open the chest. Inside, there are all sorts of wheels and gadgets swirling around and so forth. It says, but, you know, I said, yeah, obviously mechanical. I go away. I come back again some time later. And this time, the, 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 the illustration is almost perfect. Uh, everything seems natural. The skin feels right and so forth. And, uh, again, the chest thing, but this time inside the chest, it looks like flesh and blood. He says, of course, we haven't gotten it quite there yet, but isn't the imitation perfect? You know, there are vessels and there's blood flowing and all that sort of thing. Fine. I, and I'm amazed. And I go away, and sometime later I come back, and now it, it is, it's, 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 it's absolutely wonderful. It's extraordinary. And it goes through the various motions and so forth, and he takes out the knife, and he goes over, and the, cre- the, the creature says, No! Too much pain! I can't stand it! I don't want to be a human's guinea pig or a guinea pig human. And he starts fighting with the craftsman to stop him. Now, the question is simply here, what would I owe that creature? What is the nature of my relationship to him over time as it as this particular process evolves over time. And that's a question which we came up in the earlier panel, has come up all the way through, and it's a question which goes beyond the first particular question, the first particular thing which has to do with what technology can produce in terms of social change, which is very important, but it also, of course, produces changes in how we understand, or it leads us more accurately to situations where we don't know how we understand how we react or should react to another creature, being, entity. So let me stop with that as a short series of remarks. Uh, Let me introduce at this particular point uh, uh, Jerome Cohen, uh, who uh, is presently the director of the Hannah Arendt Center at the New School for Social Research. Uh, He was, in years gone by, actually Hannah Arendt's teaching fellow and and became a very close friend. His degree... PhD is from the, the New School, and uh, he is presently, he is of course also where he teaches now, and he's also a trustee of the Hannah Arendt Literary Trust, and uh, if you'd wondered why this uh, really marvelous series of books uh, of Arendt's writings from her entire period of her life, organized and introduced marvelously well as coming out, we have Mr. Cohen to thank for that. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to make a few remarks on the uh, conception of a human algorithm. Thank you. Um, in a recent New York Times article on, our, on artificial intelligence, an economist from MIT's Sloan School of Management was quoted as saying, its potential is far greater than simply substituting technology for human labor. Basic work that can be automated is in the bullseye of both technology and globalization. And the rise of artificial intelligence just magnifies that reality. As an illustration of the rise of artificial intelligence, the Times cited thousands of hours of recorded calls to build statistical models of words and phrases that callers use to use to describe products and problems and to create a database that is constantly updated. It's a baby, said a speech technology expert, and the more data you give it, the smarter it becomes. The goal of the system is to identify keywords among a person's spoken phrases and sentences so an automated assistant can intelligently reply. How may I help you, asked the automated female voice. I was watching American Idol with my dog on Channel 5, a distraught woman on the line said, and suddenly my TV got stuck in Spanish. 
What kind of TV, the automated assistant asked, suggesting choices that include plasma, LCD, and others? LCD, replied the woman, whom the automated assistant proceeded to direct to an artificially intelligent agent that specialized in solving problems with LCD models. Is it for this banality, I ask myself, that human beings have been displaced from their jobs and degraded? Is this the data artificial intelligence is fed, processes, and then deposits in categorically updated bases? Is this, in short, a way station to that technological global reality in which Homo sapiens, as he has appeared on Earth for at least 30,000 years, that is, since he first crushed hematite to get the red and black, he needed to paint bison, stags, aurochs, ibex, horses, and mammoths on the walls of caves in the Ardèche and Dordogne regions of France will be superseded superseded by a statistical correlation, an algorithm. Now, I want to make a, just a slight footnote here to, about these art artists, um, uh, uh, these late Paleolithic artists. However primitive their technology may have been, the ima- their imagination and skill was anything but. When Picasso saw the paintings at Lascaux, the, one of the principal caves, he was astonished. These first artists, he said, discovered everything. He did not at all, he was not at all impressed by the technology that has led to uh, innovation since then in art. He said they discovered everything which, in which he included the very idea of an image. And I don't know if any, if some of you may have seen some of these cases. There's one at Chevron that is extraordinary with these, these animals that are, um, I mean, they're leaping off the walls, so to speak. It, it, it is amazing. Anyway, to Picasso, no mean artist, they discovered everything. Um, that brings one of the points it brings to mind one of the points I want to make, and that's about progress. The, in um, Mr. Kurzweil's speech this morning, the, the idea of progress was a, a, a light motif. I mean, it was there all the time. Uh, this example, I think, of, of Picasso with the caves, the thir- with 30,000-year-old paintings, has something to say about progress. And maybe it's what Mr. Kurzweil meant that we, maybe that's something we should think critically about, as he said. Um, the, uh, that, that is not, by the way, a phrase that Hannah Arendt ever used to think critically, or she never used it approvingly anyway. Um, <laughs> you, you know, this, Mr. Kurzweil also said, and this is akin to this, that predicting the future is intelligence. That's what intelligence is. Well, I don't know about that. Um, You know, again, let me cite uh, something that Hannah Arendt once said. And that is um, that she liked to play chess. And she said when she grew up, chess, the game of chess, uh, appealed to intelligent persons. Uh, And then she, when she learned that there were machines that could uh, perhaps play better than humans, her reaction was not one of disappointment at all. It was, on the contrary, she said, perhaps we should think again about the meaning of human intelligence. Perhaps playing chess was not exactly what she meant by human intelligence. Uh, The Turing test says, I guess, that if you, uh, if if that machine is intelligent uh, enough to beat you, I mean, for example, enough to beat you at a game of chess, then there's no difference between you and that machine. Okay. That was the, my first reaction, and it was one of what I, what I think of as outrage. Uh, now I'm going to mention a, I'm going to turn to a second first impression, and that I call disbelief. And I'm going to begin by reading to you from two simulated documents that I've, I've simulated actually from other documents. Real documents. Okay, the first one reads, It is a theater in which you yourself are the play. It is an edifice, but it is alive. 
It is a system of knowledge, a library of sorts, but one in which each book contains another book and another book inside of that. Indeed, within within every letter on every page, another volume unfolds. Yet these volumes take up no space. It is rather as if the human skull had spaces or invisible chambers opening within it. Knowledge grows unseen and of itself in these concealed inner cavities, which are lined with little shelves where fragments of writing in the nature of keys are discovered. These keys lead to a box, which contains a key that contains another key, but these keys are not made of metal, nor these unfolded boxes of wood. On the contrary, they are made of the quintessence of knowledge, left when books are no longer wanted. They will enable us to remember not only the past, but also the future. This is a thought machine, a machine that thinks itself and about itself. That's the first. Now, here's the second one. We have the ability to understand our own intelligence. The uniting of man and machine will transcend the limitations of our biological bodies, including the complex muscle we call brain. We will have the power to control our natural fate not excluding our mortality. By fully understanding human thought, we will vastly extend and expand its reach. The fusion of unlimited human intelligence with universal reason will produce the sweetest music, the deepest art, the most beautiful mathematics, such as was never heard, seen, or conceived before. In brief, we will engineer the universe. Now, this machine man and thought machine, are separated by half a millennium, 500 years of real time. One of them was the enthusiasm of a certain Guido Camillo, an Italian engineer in the service of Francois I, Francois I, the king of France in the first half of the 16th century. The other is that of Ray Kurzweil, a 21st century inventor, futurist, and who is, as you know, the keynote speaker at this conference. Now, would anyone care to point out similarities or differences between the two? Or would would anyone with no previous knowledge of either project care to point out which is which? (laughs) One thing is surely noteworthy. The sweetest music, deepest art, and most beautiful mathematics will not be experienced, much less verified, by man as he is today, but by what Kurzweil envisions as the singular unity of man, nature, and machine. The singularity, as he calls it, will arrive in the not distant future, within 30 years or so, as the inevitable, or perhaps unavoidable, evolution of our galloping technology, the next enormous hurdle, you could say, on the race course that has led from the abacus to electromechanical calculating machines to electronic computers. In the sweep of its progress, technology will perforce compress the great diversity of human beings, their names and stories, their experiences in and of the world, their achievements and failures, into a simulated logos, a computer-generated cloud of fragmented, fragmented information. Since Aristotle, it has been axiomatic for thinkers that the logos, the human ability to say what a thing is, is not that thing, not its concrete existence. In a simulated logos, however, existence is not a concrete but an abstract predicate from which all historical and temporal markers, since the singularity has no objective or practical use for them, have been deleted. In other words, this conception of technological progress is of a progression through homogeneous empty time or vacant time, that is, time without moments, time in which there is no now, time that contains nothing to condition and limit men and women as human beings. This, as has been said more than once in this conference so far, one of the um, prides, one one might say, of of, uh, technology is to um, unlimit, to get, to to break through human human limits. 
Arendt probably would remind us that to totalitarians, unlimited, unlimitedness signified omnipotence, which can be heard in their formula, everything is possible. In the Gulag and Auschwitz, Stalin and Hitler actually succeeded in fabricating on earth the reality of hell, where human beings became corpses before they died. That was not possible without technology. Okay, that's the end of my disbelief section. I come to the final section now, which I call indignation. (laughs) How can calculating the consequences of the present state of our technology be related to the thought of Hannah Arendt, in whose name, in some sense, we are convened this afternoon? Probably speaking, I have no answer to that question, and the best I can try to do is to tell you why. Arendt once remarked that every great political thinker has thrown one word into our world, has augmented it by this one word, because he responded rightly and thoughtfully to certain decisively new experiences of his time. In responding to the unprecedented experiences of her own time, Arendt also augmented the world by one word, and that word is plurality. As I see it, an abyss yawns between her fundamental concept of human plurality and the singularity of the human algorithm that we have heard about today. Because this abyss is more than a logical contradiction, no bridge, I believe, can be built to cross from the activity of thinking aren't practiced to which the manifold, uh, in, in which the manifold meanings to her of plurality are revealed to the prospect, no matter how complexly complexly sentient our tools are or may become, of computing the future. The point is not that the latter can never be done, but that cannot always be done, and not only in the realm of politics, though that is um, Aaron's primary concern. To take an extreme example that is not political may be of some help. Michelangelo said he beheld the images he sculpted in the raw blocks of marble prior to manipulating them. The purpose and culmination of his sculpting, he said, was to free the image, that is to release it from the covert of his imagination so that the beauty of its meaning might appear to his peers as it had already appeared to him. No works of his more clearly illustrate this process than the four larger-than-life-size sculptures done between 1520 and 1530, which are known as the, to us as the blockhead slave, the bearded slave, the beardless slave, and the crossed leg slave. These, these slaves, I'm sure that you can see them all in the Academia in Florence, they're, they're emerging, emerging from, from, the, from the rough marble. Um, The slaves have embodied different meanings for different people at different times. Some have seen the slaves emerging from the stone as every man struggled to be free. To others, it is man's soul that strives to be free of his body. In this regard, it may be noted that these sculptures were originally intended to be part of a tomb, the Julius II, the Pope's tomb. To some, the slaves embody the human condition of mortality, that is, of men who live and are bound to die. And to others, they reflect the necessity from which human beings as such cannot escape as long as they are alive. These multiform meanings, and many more might be adduced, have nourished the opinion that Michelangelo left these sculptures unfinished. Be that as it may, the diversity of those meanings can hardly be understood as one sense datum. Of course the sculptures exist in sensuous stone, and it may be possible to correlate statistically the motions of the sculptor's hands with the weight of his tools and the density of his marble. But it does not follow that the meanings of the beauty Michelangelo bestowed upon us, whatever they turn out to be, can be expressed in an algorithm. Unless we want to deny meaning to artworks altogether, as Andy Warhol sought to do. There was something I had here, I didn't read it, but um, Andy, Andy Warhol, uh, you, you know, I don't know whether you like his art or not, he certainly said awfully interesting things. He frequently expressed his desire to become a machine, 
Why? Because a machine can repeat, as he put it, not essentially the same, but exactly the same thing. And the more you look at the same exact thing, he continued, the more the meaning goes away and the better and emptier you feel. That, that's, that's, quite, that's quite a statement. To, to get, I would say, I would only add to it that that itself is a meaning. And it is certainly the meaning of his uh, serial silkscreen fabrications. Um, okay. Okay, so, uh, so that's what I meant by uh, getting rid of the meaning of artworks as Andy Warhol sought to do. Michelangelo's slave sculptures are not arbitrary facts. They are not commensurable with trees struck by lightning, which they would be if we ceased to distinguish meaning from matter. If there is no common ground between the plurality of men in Arendt's thinking and the singularity of the machine man foreseen in Kurzweil's reckoning, in itself that lies on the surface of a deeper perplexity. There is no time now to trace Arendt's diverging and converging trains of thought, but that no optimism is to be found in any of them is, I believe, certain. In an essay in which she recognizes that technology has provided the unity of the world, she writes that technology can just as well destroy it, noting that the means of global communication were designed side by side with the means of global destruction. Let's listen to her for a moment. From a, and this is a quotation, from a philosophical viewpoint, the danger inherent in the new unity of, commun- of mankind seems to be that this unity, based on the technical means of communication and violence, destroys all national traditions and buries the authentic origins of all human existence. This destructive process can even be considered a necessary prerequisite for ultimate understanding between men of all cultures, civilizations, races, and nations. Its result would be a shallowness that would transform man, as we have known him in 5,000 years of recorded history, beyond recognition. It would be more than mere superficiality. It would be as though the whole dimension of depth without which human thought, even on the mere level of technical invention, could not exist, would simply disappear. This leveling down would be much more radical than the leveling to the lowest common denominator. It would ultimately arrive at a denominator of which we have hardly any notion today. To the question, are automation and rational systems making humans superfluous superfluous in a politically dangerous way? One can only answer, making human beings superfluous in any way is always politically dangerous. But then, from a political viewpoint, does not what Arendt calls the unity, and we have been calling the singularity, after Mr. Kurzweil, of mankind entail human superfluousness in general? Why? First, because for Arendt, the raison d'etre of politics is the freedom that can be experienced only in action. Second, because no man can effectively act alone, but only in solidarity with his fellow men. Third, because plural men can act together only into a common world, that is, a world held by them in common, a world constituted by the distinct meanings they find in it and their agreement that it is the same world which provides those meanings, exactly as we saw, albeit in miniature, in the case of Michelangelo's sculptures of slaves. The one thing slaves are not, and this is the heart of Aristotle's still unsurpassed analysis of slavery in his politics, is free to act and think for themselves. It is not that they are determined by nature to be unfree, but in his words, that they are human, not through their own nature, but through another's. In her account of the modern age, Arendt implicitly asks whether humans still want to be free. That is, whether we are willing to pay the price exacted by freedom, Put in the simplest terms, that price demands we give up the pretense of knowing the consequences of our actions. For if we did, history would be nothing but an idyllic and constant harmony of free wills or the infallible unfolding of a rational design. That is not a description of the times in which Arendt or anyone else ever lived or in which we now live. 
from which he draws the ineluctable conclusion that human beings are free, ontologically free, free even to relinquish their birthright to act spontaneously. Running parallel to this is what, is, is what astonished Arendt when she attended the trial of Adolf, Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. Namely, that though human beings by their nature are disposed to think, they can also cease to think. When thought and action are brought together, the question of morality, of what a human being ought to do, is. Moral, according to Kant, who Arendt deemed um, not only the greatest but also the last moral philosopher worthy of the name. Every moral act is independent of both what came before and what will follow it, and in which no one is ineligible to engage because he or she cannot know its consequences, or on account of some special disfavor of destiny, or the niggardly endowment of a stepmotherly nature, as he put it. What is in question in morality is, in short, the dignity of every human being. And that's why, after outrage and disbelief, my final first reaction to the conception of a human algorithm, which would rather do nothing than act unwittingly, uh, unwitting of the consequences, is indignation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, Jerry. Um, if you want to, wanted to know where various of the devices that you have that are technologically generated or technologically enabled got their start, you're probably looking at the man who made it happen. Uh, David S. Rose here is chairman and chief executive officer of AngelSoft which is a international platform for early angel investing. Uh, uh, angelic, though you are, though you may be, an angel is a person who tries to make things come into existence. Uh, and he is the chairman of New York Angels. The word reoccurs. He's the chairman of Egret Capital Partners and, uh, re I guess most recently, the track chair for finance and entrepreneurship at the Singularity University which is uh, a Google and actually NASA-inspired uh, graduate program training people uh, in technology or training those who will be leaders in the next technology. He's been described in Business Week as, and I'm quoting here, a world-conquering entrepreneur. It's not quite clear what the nature of the conquest is, but he is one of the most important people in terms of the future development of technology uh, not just in this country, but in fact in the world. David? Thank you. So when our kids were little, we watched Sesame Street with them. And there was one segment that they used to have, which is one of these things is not like the other. And so here we have this wonderful academic conference today, and the one thing that's not like the other is me. <clears throat> I think I am the, the first person you've seen today who does not have a PhD, the first person who is not an academic, the first person who is not a philosopher, and the first person who is not a Hannah Arendt expert. <clears throat> So, given all that, um, do have a take BA a little, from Yale? <laughs> uh, I'm a Yale too. So, get, you know, given that, let me give you my background and tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm actually trained originally as an urban planner, very concrete, building cities, uh, how people live and where they go. Uh, I then started out in, in politics, working for Senator Moynihan as his urban affairs expert. Decided that I was at heart an entrepreneur, wanting to create businesses. So I went, went back to business school, got an MBA in finance. So my my graduate degree is in um, money in the hard world of, of economics not philosophy or, or academics. Um, I then spent a decade in real estate development. I've spent several decades now in technology development, in the internet space, uh, in the investing space. Um, I guess my, my higher degree, I got, I got an honorary doctorate in, of engineering this year from Stevens, so uh, very much not in the philosophical end of the world, in the concrete end of the world. Um, these days, my academic credentials, such as they are, relate to Singularity University, which Ray Kurzweil may have mentioned this morning, 
Singularity University, which has gotten a lot of press, um, not much of which bears any relation to what it's actually doing, uh, is a program, um, as our moderator has mentioned, which is based in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, NASA's Ames Research Campus. And it's based on Ray's work and the book, The Singularity is Near. Uh, but the goal for this operation, this is a postgraduate program and whose mission is, quote, um, to Singularity University aims to assemble, educate, and inspire a cadre of leaders who strive to understand and facilitate the development of exponentially advancing technologies and apply, focus, and guide these tools to address humanity's grand challenges. So it's a very pragmatic, near-term, hands-on kind of thing. It says, all right, based on what Ray is saying and based on all of these singularity uh, studies and, and theories, and singularity has become a shorthand very lightning rod for a lot of people getting very upset about it. But the, the essence of what Ray was talking about this morning and the book and the whole movement is this question of exponentially developing and advancing technologies. It's happening, and it's happening really fast, and it's happening really hard, and it's happening really Really now. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? What can you do about it? First, you've got to understand what's happening. And then uh, somebody in the last panel mentioned that uh, this is all academic and, and, and how, do you, how do you connect people who are, are doing the science with people who are doing real things. That's what Singularity U is all about. And so this year they had 1,600 applicants for 80 places. And those 80 participants, uh, all of whom had postgraduate degrees and were entrepreneurs, were from 35 countries. So the goal here is to let these people know this next generation of leaders know what is happening out there with uh, this advancing technology. Um, and so let's talk for two seconds. I'm going to recap what you heard this morning from Ray very, very briefly, because that's the guts of all of this you know, post-scarcity world that we live in and the singularity focus and so on. And that is that technology is developing exponentially. So instead of this linear 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you're talking about 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, fumf, or 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. As Ray points out, if you go 32 steps forward on a, uh, on a logarithmic scale, you're up to a billion. And so that means if you look at the pace of development over time, it goes like this. And that's really important because, as he pointed out in the charts that he showed you this morning, you're starting – his he posits, and I absolutely agree with that, the technology from the beginning of this planet, way, way back when, has gone exponentially. But when you're talking about sub-zero numbers, tiny little numbers, from you know, 0. 0.00001, and you double it, you get 0. 0.0002. And so the increment is very, very small. And that, inc that small increment stays very, very small, sub-1, for many, 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 many years, until all of a sudden you get into positive integers, and now you're going 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, voomph, and you're skyrocketing. And we are now at that skyrocketing level. So this isn't something new. This is just the current example of what is happening when you hit the knee of that curve. And it's happening in everything that is technology affected. But the important thing, one of Ray's later slides this morning, had to do with the concept of the part of everything that is becoming dependent on technology. Number one. So everything we're talking about, uh, everything from books to movies to, to medicine to travel to you name it, every single thing is having a greater and greater part of it comprised of technology. That's the first thought you've got to keep in your mind. And the second thought is that technology is getting cheaper and faster and more powerful at an amazing rate. So everything is becoming technology-based. Technology itself is getting cheaper and faster. Fumph. And so that means the entire world as we know it is changing. And my role at Singularity University, where, there, where my uh, you know, fellow faculty members are these you know, three-time astronauts and Nobel laureates and you know, Ray himself and uh, all these people in these, these heavy-duty technology tracks, I run the finance, entrepreneurship, and economics track. And my job there is to say, okay, here you have all these technologists and scientists who are building these robots and working on the human genome and stuff like that. And over here, you have all the academics who are considering, you know, are people, are, you know, is a computer human, is a human a computer? And so and so forth. But in the real world, where all this comes together, when the rubber meets the road, what does that mean to us? And the, the title of my introductory lecture at Singularity U is Everything You Think You Know is Wrong. Because that's true. That really is absolutely, quite literally true. 
because all the way we deal with life, the heuristics we use to make decisions, to go shopping, to, to go to the barber, whatever you're doing, is all based on a set of rules that we have grown up with and we have lived with, and that has tended to be linear thinking, or in the later stages, the Pareto principle, 80-20 rule of, of stuff that we've internalized. But that's now out the window because technology is absolutely changing everything. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples of, of why this is so important. There are two major trends um, that bear on the subject today. One of them uh, that we cover at Singularity U is the question of the future of companies. Now think about that for a second. What is the future? Why would I even talk about the future of a company? Well, it turns out that companies weren't you know, made by God. Um, the, the caves at Lesko weren't painted by your local decorating company uh, that, that uh, came out there. Companies are a relatively recent phenomenon. And why did companies start? What caused a company to exist if it's not God-given? Well, it turns out that somebody got out and got in the Ronald Coase got a Nobel Prize for this uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And the answer is that companies come into existence when the marginal cost, the, the, the cost of a, of a transaction to get something done are cheaper if you do it by yourself with people internally as opposed to negotiating for every single thing outside. So if you think about manufacturing a car, well, you need rubber for the wheel, you need tires, you need metal, you need glass done in your windshield, you need all these kinds of things. And back then, when, you, when Henry Ford was inventing the, the car over here, you had, you know, he had to go to a tire manufacturer from this place, and he had to get glass from there, and so there were lots of people involved. And it was cheaper for him to say, okay, if I'm really going to make a whole lot of cars, well, why don't I you know, put in my, uh, you know, have, have my whole metal shop here so I can make my own parts? And as long as I'm doing that, how about I'll, I'll do a... a, a a tire shop as well. Well, it turned out that by the you know 1930s, 20s and 30s or so, Ford's Rouge River plant in Detroit had over 100,000 people working in that one company. They didn't only have a machine shop for metals. They didn't only have a, manu a place to manufacture their own glass. They had a printing plant to print their instruction manuals. They also had a paper mill to make the paper for printing the instruction manuals for their car. That's how integrated it was. And that's why companies got really, really, really big. And so you had this period of time, post-industrial revolution, through the first half of the 20th century, where companies got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, employing more and more and more people, lots of jobs. OK, that's great. But then what happened? What is this technology doing? What this technology is doing is making everything faster and cheaper, more automated, requiring fewer people. So you're seeing an implosion. It got really, really big because the technology required more people to get involved. But then as technology itself got more able to take over some of these things to make it easier to create, the size of companies shrank down. And you're seeing that now across the board in every kind of company in every kind of industry. Take publishing, for example. Think, you know, Condé Nast, mag magazine publishing empire, thousands of people working for them. Well, if you've got your local newsstand, uh, there's a magazine um, called uh, Garden Style or something, which is on the newsstand right next to, you know, Vogue and other Condé Nast publications. That magazine is made by one person. Literally, the entire magazine is published by one person who outsources on the internet and other places, the editorial and the photography and the production and the circulation uh, and everything else. So it's done by a single person with lots of freelancers and outsourcing. Number two, we live in a globalized world where if you are not aware that everything now is globalized, you're missing the boat. Because whether it's, it's the creative work, the production work, um, people's personal assistants are now in India, totally globalized, number two. Number three, all this technology is leading us to a world of self-service. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, take, for example, the grocery store, right? So when your parents went uh, shopping, or your grandparents went shopping for a pickle, they'd go to the grocery store, and Mr. Hooper would, would they say, I, I want a, a pickle, and he'd go behind the counter, and he'd get a pickle out of the pickle bin, um, or he would pick a, a, a thing of cereal off the shelf and give it to you and wrap it up and, and charge you for it. Well, over time, you develop a supermarket. And what happened in the supermarket is now it became more self-service. So instead of having somebody go and pick things off the shelf for you, you went yourself and picked things off the shelf and brought it to the checkout counter where the checkout person um, uh, wrote it up on the cash register. Well, then technology comes along, and you have UPCs, universal product codes, and now you bring it to the checkout counter, and the checkout person scans it. Poof. Well, then, you know what? If the checkout person who's being paid a minimum wage can scan this thing on the thing, well, you know, you can do that too, right? Uh, I don't know if, if you've been to places like Home Depot now or some large supermarkets where you have self-checkout. You take your thing off the shelf. You take it to the cashier. There is no cashier. You go fump, fump, fump. You do the same thing. And so now you've eliminated another job there. It's more self-service to you. 
Um, I was recently in a supermarket where I walk in the front door and they hand you a scanner. What the hell are they handing me a scanner for? Well, it turns out you, you, you put in your, your supermarket affinity card, and then as you go around the shelf, you scan things on the shelf yourself. It adds it automatically to your shopping list, and then and you put it in your cart, and then as you walk out the door, you take the scanner and stick it in the thing, and it automatically totes up everything that's in your cart, charge, you know, no, ties it into your uh, supermarket affinity card, charges your credit card, and you walk out the door with nobody involved. Okay, well, keep going in the self-service thing. You've been to airports, and if you've been flying recently, you've seen uh, near the gates and terminals um, these large uh, things that used to look like snack, um, uh, snack dispensing machines, but they now dispense uh, Apple iPods and headphones and, and batteries and stuff, so you can actually buy electronics from a self-service kiosk. Well, those are pretty cool. They're sort of big things the size of this table. They require a truck to sort of move it in there and people to come around and stock it and stuff. Well, the latest generation of this kind of thing that, that we, we saw somebody pitch us as a business that's actually working these days um, is a kiosk at an airport, but it's a much smaller thing, so one guy can bring it in on a hand truck, and it's got a little computer screen on top, a little display, video display, which advertises whatever it's carrying in this computer. And then, uh, so if you want, like, green iPods, fine, you see green iPod, you want a green iPod, take your credit card, swipe it through, it goes off, charges your credit card, and then with absolutely no moving parts, uh, it dispenses your iPod for you, and you walk away. And then when, it, when it's all out of green iPods, the display stops advertising green iPods. Um, so then it only advertises red iPods. And then when the whole machine is out of everything over there, it needs to be refilled. Does somebody come in and stock it? No. The machine itself calls to its depot in the middle of the country at you know, FedEx's hub and says, uh, um, okay, I'm out, please refill me. And the depot there takes a, a canister based on what has sold and how fast it sold before, calls the UPS guy, ships it out, but doesn't ship it to a person. The, it's addressed to the machine itself. The UPS guy comes along, takes the canister off the UPS truck, holds it to the machine, that automatically through RFID opens the door of the thing, out pops the old canister, puts in the new canister, and sends it back to depot over there. Hello, the only person involved in this entire operation is the UPS guy who is delivering this thing. So you've gone from retail with Mr. Hooper and his staff doing this all the way to self-service, all the way to no service, totally non-human operated operations. All right, that's one example. I can go on, I'll give you another quickie example um, so I don't take up the entire time uh, shouting at you here. Cup of coffee, right? Your grandparents want a cup of coffee. They go to the coffee beans in, in their pantry and they would grind the beans and make their drip coffee. And then your parents would go to the local coffee shop where they brew the coffee and make your coffee for you. Well, you now go to Starbucks and you order your, you know, half venti, half silhouette, decaf, cappuccino, macchiato, whatever it is, and the barista makes the whole thing for you. Well, there's a place now in the, uh, first of all, there's an iPhone app that you can get for, you know, Starbucks iPhone app where you can build your entire cup of coffee over here uh, and then read it out to the barista. But there's a, a place in New York called the Roasting Plant. It's a chain formed by some ex-Starbucks executives where you go in and you order your half silhouette, half decaf, venti, cappuccino, whatever. But instead of having the barista make it, they have a little touch screen and they go blip, 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 blip. And then as you watch, the coffee beans go overhead into the roaster, roaster into the brewer, and milk gets added in, and untouched by human hands, out pops your finished drink exactly, repeatedly, as you want it. Well, now, if you've got some of these credit cards or an easy pass thing for tolls, you know about RFID, which can automatically scan a radio chip and know what you're doing. So now imagine you have your Starbucks Affinity card, which has your drink programmed into it. You walk in, you wave your thing there, poof, no talking at all to the barista. Automatically, your cup is made. Well, forget that. Take the next generation over here. You're now walking down the street outside. You've got an RFID scanner at the end of the block. As you walk past, it picks up who you are, what your cup of coffee is, or about you charge your credit card. You walk to the end of the block, never going into the Starbucks, and there, a machine hands you your perfect half venti because it was a decaf cappuccino done exactly as you like. Okay, so the, I can go on for about an hour and a half doing this. This is, this is happening with, with everything. When I want to get a haircut, my, I go to barberbart.com. My barber is online. And without talking to another person, I can go in and, and tap the appointment the hour that I want. I walk in, he hits it on his screen over there, and without saying a word, I can set up an appointment, go in, and get my haircut. And it goes on and on and on and on. So, what does this mean? The combination of companies disappearing, of self-service, of jobs disappearing, we are rapidly heading, not in some far off distant 50 year from now future, in the very near real term here to um, a world um, in which is not like anything we know. And this is happening now. This is not philosophy. This is not should or shouldn't happening. This is inexorable. It is happening. Wake up and smell the coffee generated by humans or otherwise, because, th <laughs> because this, this is a serious thing that we have to deal with. So think about what that means overall for society. When you had a society that didn't communicate over long distances, where people were, um, were very, where you had strong individuals who could sway by force or otherwise larger populations, generally the course of history and development was, was um, changed by one person, by a Caesar 
by a Napoleon, an Alexander. You had, a person could have a major, major impact. Then as you begin to have trade, as you begin to have communications and writing and books um, uh, disseminating information over there, you begin to expand this thing. So one person has less impact, but a few people can still have a major impact. For example, the founding fathers in the American Revolution, the, the, the communist uh, idealists in the communist revolution. A, a group of people can, it can have a major effect and move societies and move countries out of there. All right, so then you move now into the 20th century, mid to late 20th century, and you're now no longer talking about a few founding fathers. You're talking about countries, right? You're talking about the United States, the global superpower, Russia, the global superpower, and now you're moving beyond that to a level where you have regions, the EU, the, you know, the group of five, the group of 20. So all of a sudden, we are broadening the base of who can change it. So you look at Barack Obama, he, you, whether you like him or don't like him, he can't change the world single-handedly. We're no longer in a position where an Alexander the Great can come in and change the face of, of, uh, of the country, of the world. So, so what we are seeing now, all this communication, all of this dissemination of power is broadening the base of this. And so now where is this going? I would posit that this is going, in, if, if you think about the plurality that Jerry was saying, in terms of, of, of Hannah Arendt's theory of, this is, of, 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 of individual people out there, it's the ultimate end of that. It is everybody is empowered. You are getting to a point where you no longer have the kind of mega power that one person can rule the whole world. There's no one ring to rule them all. Instead, it is everybody. We, we are a, 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 in a world of logarithmically growing individuality. But now, what does that mean? So if everybody, if you have 10 billion people in the world, and everybody is their own power, not ruled by somebody else, what happens? Well, then it begins to look a lot like Harry Seldon's whole world of psychohistory. If any of you are science fiction fans and have read Isaac Asimov and his foundation series over there, when you are dealing with sufficiently large numbers of people, the, that um, supposition goes, you can predict pretty accurately where things will go based on each person acting out of their own enlightened self-interest, sort of uh, as with uh, Adam Smith. So now what we see is this stuff is happening, and all these discussions and academic uh, analyses of you know, what should we allow happening, should we allow cloning or stem cell research, should we do X, Y, or Z, forget it, non-issue. Because you know what? It's going to happen. It's going to happen whether you legislate against it or not. It's going to happen here. It's going to happen in Guatemala. It's going to happen in the North Pole. It will happen. You, this, is, this is like you know, King Canute saying, stop, you know, tide, stop. Can't stop. It's going on. Whether it should, and I'm not opining here as to whether it should or shouldn't happen. I'm telling you, it is happening, and you can't stop it. And so, therefore, the question is, what the heck do you do about it? Or, given here, how do you personally relate to what is going on here? So, I think the, the net effect of all this is going to be: you look at the near term, the midterm, and the long term. In the near term here, we have, major, we have major unemployment now, and part of that in this country is uh, a uh, part of the recession. Uh, started there in current economics. But that's only disguising the fact that everything I told you before about the shrinking of companies, the disappearing of companies, the self-service, we are, we are ending up in a world where there are going to be fewer jobs. You know, that's a fact. Face it. There are going to be fewer jobs, number one. And the kinds of jobs that are going to be cut out are the jobs at the bottom of the pyramid because the jobs that are going to be available in this self-service economy when it doesn't require a barista trained in making cappuccinos to make your coffee over here, okay? Those are the jobs that are going to go. When it doesn't require, you know, a, a maid to make your bed because you have, um, uh, you know, a machine doing it. Or uh, if you think about agriculture, the largest industry in the United States, I don't know if you've seen the current uh, mechanized agriculture, they have one giant thing, a, a combine comes in and goes voomph, like the size of this, of this auditorium, goes right over the whole thing, and as it goes through, it picks up the stuff, it takes the stuff, it bails it, it pops out the other end, kicks it into a truck, and away it goes. So the kinds of jobs that are disappearing are the jobs at the bottom of the pyramid. And we are, I, I was talking to one of the nation's leading um, uh, school system runners last week, and his point was very sobering. He said, in our state, we are graduating 40% of people out of our high schools who are not equipped to hold a job in our society today. That's a very, very scary thought. So there are fewer and fewer jobs. They're being cut from the bottom out. And so the, in the near term, near to midterm, we're going to have a real issue when there are just not going to be jobs available for people to live with. But that's, a, you know, for better or worse, that's a near-term question. Because when you get into the midterm question, then you get to the subject of this panel, which is a post-sufficiency economy. 
Because with all of this increasing technology and self-service and everything else, we will be at a point where I honestly believe everybody will have a sufficient, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, everybody will have food and everybody will have shelter. I mean, and if you think that that's you know, ridiculous, look at what's happening. We, we say you know, much of the world is in poverty, but, but a lot of that poverty is, re is relative. I mean, you know, uh, Roosevelt, uh, chicken every pot, a car every garage, everybody in the U.S. now, some way or other, has, you know, has enough to, has food. It may not be great food, they may not be eating truffles, they may not be driving a Maserati, but whether it's through mass transit or through basic subsistence, um, we, the, the re relative inequality is growing. The rich are much richer than the poor um, and have, have ever been. On the other hand, the base level of subsistence is rising. And ultimately, you will see in the midterm, I believe, a, a post-sufficiency world in which everybody now has enough to, to survive. And that gets to be real. So, for example, at Singularity University last year, one of the projects was, um, you know, you, you can back up. My hobby happens to be letterpress printing, believe it or not, and a totally anachronistic hobby. I hand set type and hand print like Gutenberg. That, that's, that's, my, you know, that's my hobby. But, you, know, probably read, you probably read books, too. And I read books. And I have, I'm a book collector. I have a library, too, right? But, you know, and so, therefore, I can say, you know, the book is dead. Take, you heard it here first. Take it from me. The book is dead. Now, I have total street cred. I can say that. As a book collector, I'm president of type of files. I print this kind of stuff. But the book is dead because the book as we know it was a technological business solution that lasted 500 years, started in 1451 with Gutenberg inventing the uh, mold for casting movable type because the goal was to how do you disseminate and store information? Well, you know what? We can now do it on my iPad a whole and, and buy books on Amazon and, and, and go from the mind of the author to the mind of the reader like that. Okay, and you don't require giant printing presses, handset type, photo offset lithography, or anything else in there. All right. So um, with, with 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 this kind of of, of world um, that is is changing, you are going to have a, a world in the in the future where everything is sufficient. So now, and if that's the and that that's before we get to the singularity, right? Because you were talking before about the replicator in, in Star Trek. The kind of stuff that they're that they're you know going through theoretically at Singularity U and the nanotechnology is absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, there's a guy there, the guy who my counterpart who runs the nanotechnology program, Ralph Merkel, can actually show you how to build a replicator, a desktop Ooh. nano factory. I mean, it will blow your mind. Literally, how you move at, and, and the, the the students there are going on a field trip to IBM's Olmeden Labs, where you can actually move atoms using a six million dollar electron microscope, and you can pick up electrons and move them here and there. And it's it's not that far a leap. You know, a 10 year leap, 20 year leap, 30 year leap, not 40 year leap, to beginning to take atoms and move matter and change things around and create things. You can change atom you know, one into atom two, molecule one into molecule two, and create stuff out of there. So the question, so in the near term, you've got a real employment problem because we are having, there are not going to be enough jobs to let people you know, earn a living. In the midterm, you're going to have a post sufficiency world for a short period of time. And then, and only then, do you begin to get to the singularity when all this stuff that we're talking about theoretically here comes into play. And when that happens, what happens? I have no bloody idea. Thank you. Thank you. Before going to the audience, uh, two remarks, one about the, the midterm question. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was once uh, uh, to told but during the Depression, but, you know, in the end, the market will take care of it. And Keynes's response was, in the end, we're all dead. <laughs> uh, and the second interesting thing about uh, your, your last... No, but uh, that's, not, that's not an unimportant response to what you're saying. Uh, the second is quite interesting, which is uh, uh, the, the logic of what you're saying is that we have finally fulfilled the dream uh, of the alchemists. Absolutely. Uh, and, Abs absolutely. And that is the, the, that is the future. Let me, let me go to questions there. Uh, black shirt back there. Um, the post-efficient world that you're describing uh, does not sound nearly sufficient to me. I, I, I'm scared by you. <laughs> now, I shouldn't say, I, and as much club. by you as what you're saying and the way you say it and the obvious pride with which you say it. Um, what price are we paying for automation, for all this automation? Um, I have, of course, seen the self-service checkout counters that you talk about, and I deliberately choose not to use them because I would l rather have a conversation with David my cashier who gives me my coffee every morning 
um, because um, the bottom line is you need a few, few million neurons to create a bigger enough network to get into the ball game of making meaningful distinctions between humans and machines. And the more we interact um, with machines, we act like machines ourselves. And we, play, we pay the price of relate, relatedness. And at what great cost uh, to ourselves and our civilization, uh, I, that's the long term. And we, none of us know the answer to that. But as a psychologist, I can tell you it is catastrophic. Uh, and a, what would you call exponentially, expen, exponentially developing te technology, um, I call the mass annihilation of human subjectivity. Okay. For, first, first of all, let me be very clear. It's not a question of pride or not pride. I'm not, I'm not you know, creating that kind of, kind of stuff there. What I am doing is saying very pragmatically from somebody who lives, eats, and breathes in this space, this is happening. Like it or not, when, and I'm not making a value judgment. Maybe, you know, I, maybe I should make a value judgment, but I'm not. In this particular case, I am saying that it is happening. And like King Canute, we can say this is going to annihilate society. And you know what? It may well annihilate humanity. It may well annihilate people. But it's going to happen. So the question is we can either sit here, and, and, I, and I think it's perfectly laudable that you want to have a, a handmade cup of coffee and talk to a friend. I, I said I'm a book collector, and I print type by hand, right? So I love books. I, for my entire life, I have collected, and I print, and I adore books, a physical thing. I am also a rationalist, and I know that it is, there is no longer an economic reality that says I should be reading a book. I can read it faster, cheaper, more instantaneously, have access to more long tail on my thing. And that is not going to go away. Okay, because if you look at the 10 billion people who are going to be in this world, the 6 billion who are out there now, with access to these things, it's going to happen. So, so I, I, am, I am in no way making a value judgment. Okay, and I'm not saying you shouldn't make a value judgment, but I am saying, pragmatically speaking, you know, we, we, it's going to happen. Let's let, let's it's excuse me. We, it, there are a lot of people wanting to ask questions. I mean, and there's a lot of argument to be had, and I'm restraining myself. We, we have, to, have to do it also. <laughs> Gentleman okay, over there. I have a, a question. Before I came here, I closer, please. Heinrich Brucher. Closer, microphone closer. Can you, what? Can you? It's on, I think, just closer. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Clo very close to your mouth, sir. I came here, I Okay, before I came here, I reread uh, The Common Cause by Heinrich Brücher. Heinrich Brücher was Hannah Arendt's husband. The Common Cause came out of his lectures at the New School, and I attended those lectures in the 50s and 60s. Rereading Heinrich, I find that uh, his answers, which were written 40 years ago, and what he said is very pertinent today. He said, man has the capability to destroy each other and to destroy the planet. He said, scientists do not have, have answers, but they do not have the final answers. The, what I see, and most of all, we do not have the political will to do something about the basic problem. And the basic problem is not to create no scarcity, but to the distribution of, of the goods, the, uh, the ability to take care of this planet. By the year 2080, the sea level will have risen two to four feet. Sir, let me ask you to, to come, come to the question, yeah, because there are a lot of people here. That's my question. I'm almost done. And uh, a lot of other things will have happened. And in 3,000 years, we have not, in nearly 3,000 years of recorded history, we have not had the political will to deal with the basic problem. You can call me a Luddite, but not until you answer my question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take? The, question, the question, I think, is, is there there is a lack of political will to deal with this problem and in that sense things run on just as they as they will because human beings are unable or incapable of intervening and directing them in a particular way i think that's you know, Jared, you want? Well, 
Um, Close to the phone. Well, that may be true in, in, in many, many, many cases, perhaps the great majority of them, but it truly is not always true. It is certainly not the case that the, in 1798, for better or worse, the French had a political will that, that, and created a revolution. I mean, so, for one example. Sometimes it, but I, 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 a quick answer. I, I think the, the, bigger, the biggest question here, out of what you, your, your speech, has to do with the distribution of resources. And that, I think, is a real issue mm-hmm. that, is, that is facing society, facing our planet. And, ha- you know, and, and at some point, I believe that that begins to, to disappear in the post-sufficiency world. The problem is we don't get to a post-sufficiency world overnight. And there is that time between now and then, whenever that then is, where the distribution is, is a challenge. Gentleman over in the far end of there. Right. So I have a question for Mr. Rose. And <laughs> this, is a, this is a political question. Now, where the hell does the singularity, even in theory, interact with politics? Where does it interact with basic human behavior? Where does it solve basic problems inherent with social frictions? The identity of humans is sometimes backstabbing, conniving, vicious political creatures, regardless of how much alchemical magic we have at our disposal. How do any of these social problems that create woe and misery, how do any of these get solved or in any way interact with? Well, that, to which my answer is, um, this is this is a tool. I mean, the technology is a tool. Technology, I believe, is not inherently good or bad. It, it amplifies. And so the question then becomes, if you're, if you're, whether you're a utopian or a dystopian, the question is, what do you think society is? And if you give society this extraordinarily amplifying tool, what happens then? I happen to be enough of a, if, if not a utopian, at least an optimist, and I believe sort of with Anne Frank that, that there is just enough, you know, enough, just enough more than 50-50 good in the world. I think Ray Kurzweil is an optimist also. So I believe that if, if you accept the fact that humanity is at least 50.01% good and you give humanity these tools that are amplifiers, um, then you, it will ultimately be to the good. And, and so it's not gonna, technology is not going to make people not backstabbing, not sleazy, not whatever. There will be, but there are good people and there are bad people. I happen to be an optimist and think we're better than that. Okay. Uh, I, I, have, I have a question to the question of optimism, and I have a question also to uh, Professor Cohn's presentation. But, but for me, the issue here, which came in your presentation, with regard uh, to the grocer who gets that pickle for you. Now, one of the things about your assumption is, is a widget assumption, which is common in business school, namely that these things are interchangeable and that the pickle that you pick up as you do your own self-service is the same as the pickle in the barrel. And anyone who knows something about pickles and how you make them knows that this is not the case. Pickles are actually the most volatile things in the world. They're very complicated. And for someone like me, born in New York, I mourn their disappearance because you cannot get them. That is to say, you can't have them. And the, the, the problem with that is that you treat everything as a replacement. And that speaks to the question of both the singularity and replaceability. One of the things that one has when one says, every bit of my body could be replaced, forgets the fact that if we look at any of these young people here and we said, how would you like a hip replacement? Your hips are fine, but why not take one of these nice titanium models? We have one for you. Very few people would, be, would jump at that chance. Likewise, implants, they will last the rest of your lives. It's not the case that you want to knock your teeth out and replace them, although most people who go into Hollywood do just that. Now, one, now one, one, that question brings me back to that question, which is, which is the question to Professor Cohn, which is namely the progressivism issue. When Picasso says... It's already there, that they have it. It's all there. What he's referring to about the caves of Lascaux is that our assumption is that the technology of, an, of ancient times, remember, they made these caves, they made these paintings in caves without light. That's the really remarkable thing. And the question is, how did they get the light there? They had to go in their bellies. There's been no change in the structure of the caves. So getting there is really the question. So we have a problem with understanding the technology that the cavemen used, as well as the technology of painting on the walls at the time. What kind of tools did they have? I myself theorize they used their mouths, ground the hematite in their mouths, and spat them out, because that's what it looks like. It looks like spray paint. 
Now, one, one important thing then is, is the assumption of technology and progress. But there may not be progress. Perhaps people had techniques we no longer know. Okay. We, uh, uh, the, 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 as you know, the, there, there is a huge literature on, on the cave paintings. The, I mean, it seems to me the most plausible explanation that I've heard is that they had some kind of torches. There are places in the walls that look like they uh, uh, carry, carry torches. As, as I think I mentioned, they, they, it's known that they broke the hematite to get red and black. Uh, and certainly, the, the, from all uh, it, there's no evidence that there was any kind of sophisticated technology whatsoever. I, I was trying to make the point that the genius that Picasso noticed was there without any technology. And, I mean, to see those caves, you really wonder if there ever been any better paintings right. painted. Actually, one of the issues here is that it turns out, as people learn something about ancient technologies, they are far more, quote, advanced, unquote, than we had previously supposed. And the kind of progressivist picture is simply problematic. Uh, Marion Constable first, and then in front here. Um, is it working? Oh, okay. Um, I'm wondering whether the Singularity University has a position on sustainability and the timing of it in terms of the short, mid, and long term. And I oh, should I... make a disclaimer that my uh, talk tomorrow is on the rhetoric of sustainability. And my other question is um, whether anything exponentially <coughs> declines, because it seems like if information exponentially only um, increases, then uh, that's... Uh, something that isn't zero sum, right? It's infinite. And I'm wondering if there are things that are more finite that might decline or that would be taken into account in to, your position. To, to, answer, and to, answer the first question, to answer the first question, yes, sustainability is extre extremely important. As a matter of fact, this summer, in this summer's program, there were, there were five major challenges. One of them was upcycling, which had to do with, with the whole question of, of reuse of, of, of materials, and, and sustainability is, is very important. Again, Singularity University is not pushing any view, political, philosophical, or otherwise. It is, it is saying, here, you know, here are the latest things, technological advances that are happening, and now how can these be used to help Help address some of the challenges that we've got. Um, so, so for example, in terms of of, of, uh, of housing, you know, much of the world is, is ill-housed. Um, I was talking before about books and printing. With, with the advent of the laser printer in, in 1984, um, you could now everybody had their own printing press effectively. And then, um, when, when, summer before last, the singularity, one of the teams was working on printing housing. They're now, you can now get a desktop three-dimensional printer that can print a part for you. They were actually printing houses by literally, effectively hooking up a, a computer-aided design system to a gantry. You pour in concrete, and it goes blah, 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 and, and, and for less than the cost of building it, you can actually print a house. So, you, so things like that, are, you're going to see how you can apply technology to these challenges. As to the, to the question of, of things that are exponentially declining, uh, you know, I, I think if you talk to Ray about that, um, as long as there's matter in the universe, ultimately, when you begin to transmogrify matter, it is un until you hit the singularity or whatever it is, some you know, undefined place out there, um, it, is, it is growth, not uh, declination. We've gone from people in red shirts to people in green shirts. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I have two questions, and they're both directed at um, Mr. Rose. Um, the first is that you s mentioned how this is almost like deterministic progress, like that there's no other way. This is happening. There's nothing we can do about it. Let's talk about it. Um, but the world that you showed me, the examples that you gave, seem to depend on one person. And I think that person is very important because there is a person still in that system. It's the self. Absolutely. And it's the consumer. And so I think uh, you kind of dismissed all this sort of questioning and philosophical, is this right, is this wrong? And I want to bring up the point that perhaps it is the person themselves who makes the choice to go to the teller and not the checkout counter. And, and so that person, um, and then the second point is that um, you say that it's, well, the ultimate end is that everyone has power, um, but then you say how it's connected to technology. And to me, the person who controls the technology has the power. So that sort of is like, yes, in the dominant like ideology that you have, okay. it controls things, but okay, yeah. I think okay, your great. question's there, right. So, 
No, no, actually, can I, can I address that in two, yes, two, two, quick, two quick sessions? So first of all, when, when I was your age, I went to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, um, and there they were showing this really cool thing. It was a robotic teller. It was an automated teller machine. And, and they gave you little cards, and you could actually see what happened. You put in a card, and you, and you get like fake money out. Right? And the, the idea that you actually have machines replacing tellers in the bank was unbelievable. Now, I don't know anybody here who would not go to a bank that wasn't tied into an ATM network. So, so ultimately, people will decide what they want. And, and, and if you look at what things are happening, you, you can say, you may personally choose to always deal with a live person instead of an ATM, but there are enough people out there to provide the market demand, so therefore it will be developed, number one. Number two, everything in terms of, of, of who creates things, entrepreneurially speaking, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs will create things, will apply human ingenuity and technology to create things for which there is a demand with enough people and when you have now have a global market of six billion people there are two billion of them have cell phones today who are connected and understand things and can search and can and make their demand felt that will drive the, the technological development over, over there let me we're, we're running let me ask you people to keep their questions short can we go to the woman in white there the man at the back in black no after you I, I, right. I promise to stick around for at least half an hour afterwards everybody wants to take shots of man, me. man in black the woman in white the man in black then Johnny Cash uh, <laughs> and, okay. uh, Mr. Rose you uh, simultaneously talk about uh, the this being inevitable and also talking about the technology only being a tool uh, it seems to me we've been uh, somehow the tool has taken over in terms of uh, what's going on because it's inevitable. We can't, we're no longer in control of it. And it seems to be a disconnect between uh, wealth and value because it's wealth that's driving the direction of the technology. If somebody wasn't making uh, a good profit on these machines that are uh, replacing people, um, we wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be created. So uh, is, uh, it seems like there, uh, we've created an economy and a, uh, an ecology, uh, a, a, an economy that's out of balance with both our ecology and our, and our society. Chal no, I, I challenge. What, what it, you know, oligarchy, you know, nasty, big, you know, rich bankers almost we don't say, I'm going to go grind the faces of the poor. They are, you know, people, entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur. People create businesses because there is a demand for it. And if nobody demands it, then, and, and, and the essence of economics is the science of the allocation of scarce resources. So we're still in an economic world right now because resources are scarce, right? And, and in a free market capitalist society, Adam Smith's invisible hand, people will, if people want something, somebody else will come in and make it. Use technology and try to make it faster and cheaper. And as long as you can make money making that, more people will come in. And then ultimately, if everybody is making the same widget that only six people want, there's not going to be any profit in making widgets. So they'll go and do something else. So, so what this leads to ultimately is an pure capitalist society with real transparency, perfect information, which we are heading to, the profit motive actually, the, the profit actually tends towards zero, okay, as you have everybody being able to supply and everybody being able to, to, to demand. So it's not somebody, wealth is not, you know, throwing the system out of whack. Um, it is what, what, what money is doing right now is providing a global means in theory, theoretically, for leveling things. There are always discontinuities in individual things, but on, on, a, on a meta basis, absolutely it's the consumer demand that's doing it, not somebody who's forcing it. Right. Over there, you jumped to Q, by the way. I was given the microphone. My apologies. No. Um, my question is for uh, Jerome Cohen. Um, you mentioned Warhol's desire to make himself into a machine precisely because he could replace or reproduce himself exactly. And that called to mind Walter Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, in which he argues that the work of art is losing its aura. And I wonder if you feel that in the age of singularity, the human being is losing its aura. The, 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 the human just, being is losing its aura. I the mean, human being. Well, you know, there were some off, Fran French philosophers not so long ago who said the human being was invented in the Enlightenment, and now that's over. <laughs> that, and I, I mean, who knows? Um, the the um, uh, ben Benjamin uh, it certainly saw this. Uh, 
diminishment of the, of the uh, of, of the work of art. I mean, it's very complex, actually, what he says. But it, but it, that is certainly in its reproducibility, right? But it seems to me that that Warhol may actually be indicating what uh, Mr. Kurzweil calls the deepest art. That that's what this deepest. To me, I can't imagine any art deeper than, uh, say, the Resurrezioni of Piero della Francesca or, or, or the Perro of Goya or what well, I could go on. Anyway, that may be what is, is, is uh, Warhol is uh, indicating, meaning, you know, what he goes on to say in that same sentence is that we empty it of meaning and then we empty ourselves and we feel good. That's just like him. And, I mean, it's not silly what he's saying. Mm-hmm. He said it sillily on purpose, but it's not silly. Yeah, one of the interest, there'll be a panel on art tomorrow, by the way, because one of the interesting things about art, of course, is that its progressiveness is very hard to determine. Uh, the other thing to say about Oros, and going back to uh, Professor Babich's question, uh, and I don't mean this uh, to get a laugh, it is quite clear that pickles have lost their aura. Uh, <laughs> The question in white there, and then the man in black back there, and <laughs> go ahead. Hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Cohn, for your remarks, but um, this question is directed to Dr. Rose, and I guess it's more really that I, I guess I, I question, and I would really urge you to, to question the discrete categories that you created very early on in your talk between um, what you and your colleagues are doing over at Singularity University and people who are really involved, in, like who are entrepreneurs like yourself and people like um, many of those here today and tomorrow who are doing the work of, you know, philosophy, thinking about the political. Um, I guess because of, if what you say is true about um, part of everything having a greater and greater dependency on these certain, like, developing kinds of technologies, then this is ever more important to human life, and if it is also true what you're saying about you and your colleagues at Singularity University creating a assembled cadre of these future entrepreneurs and creators of this future world, then I think you really necessarily have to make a value judgment. And I, I think that you are obligated to if you're having this very direct role in creating this world that you, you see as inevitable, but I... I many of us, I think, would disagree. Um, And so I just, I also, I hope that you and and Mr. Kurtzweil, um, doctor, I guess, (laughs) are talking about, I just, I wonder, you're talking about this this world with no jobs and a world of, you know, sufficient... You've come, your, your question really is, does he not have to make some kind of judgment about this rather than, at least in your understanding, succumbing or allowing himself to be swept away by the inevitable tides of uh, okay. the future? So, 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 so first of all, let me make it very clear. I am not anti-philosophy. I am not anti-academics. I am actually the only person in my family who is not a, 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 a Ph.D. academic teaching at somewhere or other. Uh, my, my, my siblings and are, are, all, are all professors. Um, so it, it's, it's not that I, that I don't believe in philosophy. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I read The Republic for, for uh, uh, bedtime reading. My, my point is that, that, that what is... That Most what of us read it to get awake, but that's all right. <laughs> platonic ideal, right? My, 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 my point is that, this, that the technological advances are happening. Okay, and so, so I'm, I'm not, and, and, and so the, the wake, the clarion wake-up call here is like the, like the, you know, like King Canute or the, or the kid with the finger in the dike. I mean, it's, you know, we, we can say, oh, all of this stuff is really awful and really bad. Okay, but then what? So, so, and, and, and it, you, I mean, it, it, so the, the question is, and so if you say, turn it into action, do something about it. I mean, you can sit on a mountaintop and, and philosophize all you want, and, but until it turns to action, I believe, okay, I'm a behaviorist, um, that, that uh, it, it is the, the, the you, it can, can put it in perspective, but if, if it's going to happen and you think it's a bad thing to happen, but you do nothing to stop it, right, then what? 
If you think it is a bad thing, then you should try and do something to change it. But my point is that the force of the large-scale market, what is — technology is not independent by itself. There isn't a robot out there that is, at this point, self-replicating and building more robots. People are doing it. People are doing it either in a search for knowledge or they're doing it to fill a market need, perceived market need, economics, where people are demanding it, and it is happening. And so the question is, if you think this — if you think any particular thing is not good, then what do you try and do? You can legislate against it. You can — you can polemicize against it. But my point is, as much as I believe, as if — as you legislate or polemicize or write or think, I do not believe, pragmatically speaking, that it's going to stem the tide. So therefore, I would posit that — the question is going to happen, what do you do with it? There have been a number of questions, actually, which pick up on the fact that there is, at certain points, a certain passivity — appears to be a certain passivity in your initial starting point, and to which one might say, you know, if the old Dylan song is, you don't — something's happening, you don't know what it is, Mr. Jones, you're not wanting to be Mr. Jones. Uh, there's a question uh, in — we've been granted uh, seven or eight extra minutes by the grace of — uh, of Roger. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a question to both of you, and it relates to one of my favorite authors, Stanislaw Lem. And in one of his writings, he proposed that algorithms could come to such a degree that they could track an artist's life, and they could compute were all of the works of art that this create are, were, are, were all of the works of art that this artist going to create created. And if they weren't, it could project what works of art would have ah. been created and therefore create them. So my question to both of you is sort of three parts. Are they legitimate? What are they? And do they have value? That's, That's a great question. Great question. Yeah. Did you say what it is? Yeah. 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 Well, Go ahead. So, 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 so the question, let me replay it back. The question, as I understand it, is if a computer, yeah. based on, on taking input of an artist's work to date, can say, okay, this is what, you know, and the artist dies, hits, hits by a bus. The computer can say, projecting out the lifetime of this artist, you know, he didn't create everything that he but would he have created. But he could have painted. But that he could have painted. Yes, and therefore, we, the computer, know that he would have painted this, that, or the other thing over there, and it can then recreate art as if he would, what he would have done had he still been around. So the question is, you know, is that art, or or what is it, or is that, I guess, is that good? It's a value judgment in there somewhere, right? Um, well, I, I, I would have to say I'd have to see it. <laughs> uh, there is, I'll just mention though, in relationship to that, and could you bring the microphone down front here, the woman in, in orangish red going back? There, there is a story by Ray Bradbury uh, about uh, a absolutely perfectly developed robot and uh, is lives with a man who is a pianist, and one day. He wakes up at night and he hears the robot playing the appassionata better than anyone had ever, ever played it. And he goes to, he talks to him, and they have a conversation, the end of which is the robot says, I will never do that again. It is not meant to be played that way. <laughs> So, so, so I, I would just note one. one I'm going to interject one thing before your your question, and, th and that is something that I haven't discussed because it's a whole another question for topic for another panel. Is in this post-sufficiency world, if you assume that we we get to that point, where where traditional cash economics no longer apply because resources, the dollar rate resources are no longer scarce. What is it that is driving? You know, the, the real big factors here, you know, are human superfluous. What is driving society? And and I yeah. think and the answer to that gets into a whole series of externalities um, and. Maslow's hierarchy of needs in terms of self-actualization and what is driving people. Will everybody, like in, in the, the movie Wally, sit on a, on, a, on a boat in a beach chair or whatever spaceship and just sit there and look? Or will you do things? Will you create? I mean, I do what I do. I, mean, I work, you know, 16 hours a day um, because I love what I do. I love being an entrepreneur. I love creating new businesses. I find this intellectually challenging and emotionally rewarding, and I, and I teach. Um, so that's what's driving me, not the pure economics of it. Uh, and so, you know, do you live in a society? Will everybody make those choices that, that I mean, everybody here sitting in a room, you know, uh, in, in Annandale and Hudson listening to people pontificate about the future of, of humanity, right? That's, you know, you're not getting necessarily paid to do that. You're doing it because you want to do that. And what will happen in this post efficiency world when you can spend your entire lives at, at panels like this or creating companies or whatever? Uh, just, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to say something oh. to go ahead. 
Anyway, the question is, I raised at the very beginning, which is, are there other sources of conflict than need and needs? And if, you know, and clearly children have them. Which my, my answer is absolutely and, yes, yes, but because but, it's the externalities that drive it. There are the, not only are there sources of conflict, there are sources of reward and inspiration and, and uh, um, you know, th- things. So if I kill you because it really makes me happy, that's... That's an interesting question, but but the answer is, I, 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 and, and this gets back to the gentleman's question over here about human beings are not necessarily perfect, right? right. Yeah. So, no, so, that's right. Um, you know, and, and once you get past economics, and I believe you will get past the economics of money yeah. and, and of, of no, physical things. Yes. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask David if he's a Marxist. <laughs> My I, I, no, no, what you just said, though, sounds so like Marx. When, when he said, after, after the revolution, you know, when, when money is not going to be important anymore, when we, well, everybody will have everything, and then we'll be simply do our hobbies. No. We will philosophize in the morning or in the afternoon, listen to music. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, it's a fascinating question. You know, the, the answer is, I would love that to be the answer, but I don't posit to know the answer. I, I think it's a very real question. And I, I, I think the question, I, I, I'm not a Marxist, I am a good capitalist in the sense that I think we will ultimately get there through capitalism um, to a post-sufficiency economy. Um, so, but, but ho- however, at that point, I, I, I you know, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that's, that's I, I almost wish we had spent, you know, two hours discussing when we get to that point, what will drive us, what will make yeah. us happy, what will make us, what will cause conflict. I think those are the really big, interesting issues that, that we will clearly have to deal with at some point. Mar- Marx thought to get there, capitalism would get you there, but it would, have, it would take a revolution to do it. And uh, Lenin says, at that particular stage, natural social relations will reassert themselves, and people will behave in a, in a, norm, a normal, in a, pr- a proper sort of fashion. Well, to divert the humor and I, to stick with your, what you're saying here, though, is that this is a room full of privileged people um, who have the luxury to sit here today and listen to this kind of discussion. Um, the Singularity University is extremely expensive. Um, so, given the fact that low-level jobs are disappearing and technology is inevitable, what do we do to bring NASA University and the Singularity and all of this wonderful technology to people who right now are struggling to eat, have jobs, keep their families together, um, and get an education? That, that's, a very, that's a very good question, and, and the answer is, first of all, the majority of participants in Singularity are on scholarship. I mean, we, they, they, literally, they're from 35 countries. They, we have gone into Africa. They pulled out these kids, I mean, people literally who have nothing. I mean, so, so it, it's truly trying to be a very elitist, true, but best and the brightest. But, but her, that, her question's that, not about, no, about the Singularity No, 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 but, but, but she people, has that but that so, so I'm saying, first of all, that, that, the, that's the case there. But, but second of all, what this technology is doing through things like Apple, if you have iTunes, Apple University Online, the, the the, the amount of information that is available, the courses, you could get an Ivy League education um, with everything except sitting here in person, okay, uh, in, in 80-20 rule, right? You want, you want to hear Steve Smith lecture about political science? I've got it on my iPad right here. You, 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 want, to, you want to communicate with, with classmates and, and, and have a, a, a discourse about the republic? You can, you can do it through a social network. You are seeing the, there is an enormous change in education that is going on right now. So we have – so technology in one sense is providing the, the ability to educate a, a much greater number of people and make them haves at least uh, in terms of, of, of knowledge. Um, but there are, you know, sp- spreading, spreading everything else out to um, a larger layer is a challenge in the near term. Uh, in the interest of full di- disclosure, I must point out that Steve Smith is the master of Pearson College, of which you are a fellow. Uh, Brantford, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the press there. So. <laughs> Over there. No. Um, I guess my question is um, really like, First of all, in the examples you gave already of our society entering this, this post, let's be clear, post-human in terms of humans working in the service industry, because God knows, like, your iPad, lithium has to be mined to make the battery that's in your iPad, and that happens in the third world, like, at, like, the expense of kids who are about my age or significantly younger. And, like, my question is... I guess, are you assuming that for those kids' lives to be better, the only thing they need is access to a machine that also dispenses an iPad for them? Like, it just seems like you're assuming that, like, the progress brought around by your institute and where it's going, or in terms of, like, created by the free market information technologies, is somehow going to liberate everyone. But it, 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 it seems like you're fundamentally ignoring the fact that the kind of liberation through knowledge and information that you're talking about is ideologically based. No, what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing is skipping. 
No. The answer is I'm not, I'm not ignoring it. I'm skipping over it. Okay? I, 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 <laughs> which, which, which is actually a, a big difference. In other words, I, I am, I, I am, there is a, there is absolutely a near-term problem, which, which I explicitly said, right? But I, for example, in terms of mining lithium, right? Ultimately, I believe technology will get to a point where it's not going to require people your age to give up their lives to mine the lithium from my iPad, right? You will have, technology will be, will be developed in terms of mining, whether it's mining here or on the moon or whatever it is to do that. So that, that's, that's the, you know, the post-efficiency world, right? How, the, the, mid, the near term is where we have a very real problem, no question about it, right? Um, and, and, so, and that's where things like only, only wanting to buy sustainable stuff, and, you, know, you go to Starbucks because they're doing sustainable growth of coffee beans as opposed to somewhere else, or you're, going to, you're, you're, you're not uh, buying XYZ jeans because they're not you know, done in, in rational factories. They're that's treated. where people can have a society, us individually, can have a real impact. But the, it's, but, and so my, my point is, yes, those are very, very real problems mm -hmm. in the near term. And if, ultimately, if we really screw it up, we'll destroy our society and we won't be around in the longer term. But, but, my, but assuming we can get through there some way or other, I do believe that there is a point at which all the other stuff comes into play. Uh, there, this will be the last question. There's a man in green, which is the color for the evening. And <laughs> at that point, that's you. I, it looks like green from here. <laughs> Feels like gray. <laughs> Mr. Rose, uh, you repeatedly say you're not pushing any view, political, economic, philosophical, moral. Try not to. I would argue that given the nature of the work that you do, not to expound a moral view is to expound a moral view. Fair point. That, no, I, I think that's, that's a fair point. I, 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 would, I would agree with that, right? So, 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 the, so, so, so the, the, the question then is, in what, in terms of, of moral view, what is my moral view? So, for example, personally, I don't, I don't invest in in companies that with new alcohol stuff or gaming things or sexual whatever. I mean, th th this is in terms of, of of my particular stuff, right? Um, if the if the moral view was, should I not support um, you know uh, early you know, young entrepreneurs who are creating new ways of communicating in online social networks because social networks ultimately could be bad. That, then, then yes, I'm making a moral decision that I, I do not follow, that I do not believe in that, so therefore I will support these young entrepreneurs doing that kind of thing. Because ultimately I am optimistic that this tool will be good. So, a lot, so some of this, in some, to some extent, stems from my innate optimism, which, which is that people are good, and therefore if one enables people in things that are not arbitrarily bad, that ultimately it will be good. But, but so, so that's in terms of my personal action, which I absolutely have to live with myself and, and have a moral view. The points, the points I was making, however, are that this stuff is happening, whether it's me or somebody else, whether they're funding it, inventing it, or whether it's going to be a robot, it's going to happen. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I think that, every, and, and my, my last word, and then I'll get pulled off here, um, is that whatever your belief is, and everybody is entitled and encouraged to have their own belief, you should turn it into action yourself. And if every, if six billion people all have the same thought as you do, and all work, turn that into action in concert, then you will change the planet exactly as you want. But unless you do something, it, every, what everybody else does with their actions is going to triumph. But we will, we will, just a second, we will go actually immediately to uh, the next panel, which is the keynote uh, by, by Sherry Turkle. Uh, thank you all for being here. I apologize to those we didn't get.